Hi, I'm Mark Trexler with The Climatographers. One of the reasons we've built The Climate Web is to help really flesh out this idea from John Maynard Keynes that it's very hard to predict the future, number one, and it's very hard for us to get our heads around different views of the future. And yet for thinking about climate change, it's pretty important to understand what the different perspectives that people are bringing to the table in terms of some of the key aspects of climate futures. And that's why we've put together this video as part of a course to look at what are people actually talking about. If you read one of several books that we've recently read to explore this question, what are people talking about when they lay out a particular decarbonization rate? What are they assuming about the implied costs and risks of decarbonization, the speed and magnitude of climate change, and the implied impacts, costs, and risks of climate change itself? Taking into account that uncertainty increases over time, as you can see on that x-axis, and climate risk obviously increases with global temperature, as you can see on the right axis. And so here are some of the books that we've read recently that we thought would be useful for having this conversation. The first one is a science fiction book, One Second After, which I'll get into in just a second. Then you get into something that most of you are probably familiar with, Jacobson's series of studies on 100% clean and renewable energy. George Bacchus's report from 2021 that I doubt many of you are familiar. Vaclav Smil's new book, How the World Really Works, that's gotten quite a bit of attention. Steve Koonin's book that came out late last year, but that's gotten a lot of attention in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere. And then Alex Epstein's book, 2022, Fossil Future, Why We sh Should Be Burning and Will Be Burning Much More Coal, Oil, and Natural Gas. And so I thought it would be useful to explore what are the fundamental messages being uh, delivered through these different studies. Not saying which one is right or wrong, but saying here are the different worldviews that are out there that people are hearing in their different echo chambers, et cetera. So what I've done is I've gone through and looked at what is the fossil fuel use and the decarbonization rate assumed by each of authors. And that's uh, uh, shown by a dark green line, as you'll see in just a second. Then the level of decarbonization costs versus climate impacts and climate risks I'll also show what the implied average global temperature is for what people are assuming. And if it's fundamentally different from that implied temperature, what the conventional science today suggests for the average temperature associated with that scenarios. Now, in most cases, these books don't lay out a graphic, anything like what I'm going to be showing you. And so we've taken some artistic license to try and, and boil it down to a consistent ability to compare these different reports. So let's start with one where we can all agree, ironically, science fiction. This book, One Second After, there have been many books like this based on an electro electromagnetic pulse attack or a solar flare. And so you get instant global decarbonization. And it's pretty safe to say, and that's shown on the far left there by a vertical uh, green line showing instant decarbonization and a vertical red line showing instant catastrophe because it's pretty well accepted that instant decarbonization would be catastrophic. And we can probably all agree on the implications of instant decarbonization. It's by far the most clear and most certain of all the different decarbonization scenarios. The question is, as soon as you get away from instant decarbonization, what happens and what are you assuming? And that's what the rest of these reports are taking a look at. So. Mark Jacobson's work, which is everywhere and which I'm sure you're very familiar with, basically 100% clean energy, suggesting that we could get to about 80 per clean energy by 2030 and 100% and by 2050, even without nuclear biomass or direct air capture. There are some near-term economic impacts, but longer term, the economic impacts are positive. And obviously the climate impacts are, are quite moderate because this is basically the 1.5 degree scenario. And that's why you actually see the, the two blue lines superimposed on each other, uh, because this is the consensus view of if we can get to net zero by 2050, uh, we could potentially limit climate change to 1.5 degrees. Jacobson's work doesn't really get into climate change per se. So unlike most of the others that I'll talk about, his is primarily an energy analysis with rapid decarbonization 
and no real disruptions, either from decarbonization or from climate change. It's a very desirable scenario. So then let's take a look at George Bacchus's study that came out last year, climate risk and response too much and too little. George is a risk expert and put together a scenario model. And his basic point is that we are pretty much incapable of walking and chewing gum at the same time. And so we won't do anything optimally. And that has a lot of implications for temperature and for the impacts of climate change. So what Bacchus ends up with from a decarbonization perspective, as you can see in the green line, is a, a short-term increase in carbon use because his basic point is that building all of the renewable energy generation that we'll need for the future decarbonization is actually going to take a lot of energy. So there's a big bump in gas use in the near term, but then you pretty much get close to decarbonization by uh, 2060, he does assume a lot of direct air capture after that. But what he's basically saying is the best we may be able to do is about 3.5 degrees, even with this scenario of rapid decarbonization after 2040 or so, because we won't have an optimal response. And as a risk person, he thinks that's a very bad place to be in terms of the red line combining the costs of decarbonization and the impacts of climate change. So you're in a pretty bad place in the Bacchus scenario. Vaclav Smil's new book, a very different perspective. What he's basically saying is that climate, yes, climate change is a serious problem, stipulates that right up front, but that decarbonization is going to be very difficult. And so decarbonization takes place over a long period of time. I have it there as a straight green line going all the way out across the century. And even then you don't get to hundred percent decarbonization. His assumption is that climate change probably isn't as bad as a lot of people are arguing. And so I, I have the temperature line to two degrees, even though I think a lot of the conventional science would suggest that his emission scenario is probably closer to a 3.5 or even four degrees. And he does think that there will be disruptions. It's more on the climate side than it is the decarbonization side, because in his view, we're just not going to be able to decarbonize nearly as rapidly as a lot of people are assuming. Now, let's jump to a very different book that came out late last year, gotten a lot of attention, particularly in what you, you might think of as skeptic circles. Kunin is not a climate denier. He, he states right up front and, and he is a scientist. He states right up front, I think climate change is happening. I think we should be doing something about climate change. But he does vary from, from some, many of the other scenarios that are out there. He basically doesn't see a reason for alarmism. He thinks we have time. He also thinks that decarbonization will be much more difficult than a lot of people are assuming. And so he too has this green line that ends up without full decarbonization, even out to 2100, he too ends up assuming that the impacts of climate change aren't awful. By 2100, even though, again, I think that the conventional science would suggest closer to three degrees rather than uh, two degrees based on his scenario. And his view is that we can avoid many of the problems of decarbonization by starting out gradually and that we have time to deal with a lot of the impacts of climate change and that we won't be in that bad of a place by 2100 we have time to get this under control. Now, the last book, one that came out very recently, which is now getting quite a bit of attention, and a lot of people are going to love this message. And so it's worthwhile understanding what it is. So his book is entitled Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas. He's self-taught on energy and climate change, apparently over the last 14 years, coming from a, a background as a philosopher. His view is basically that the whole industrial revolution is built around fossil fuel use. He argues that people who want to reduce fossil fuel use actually are trying to reduce or eliminate human impact on the earth. A bit of a, an extreme argument, you might say. But he also points to the three billion or the billions of people that are currently energy poor that need energy. And the only way they're going to get that energy is fossil fuel use. 
and probably not coincidental. His view about climate change is that yes, climate change is happening, but it's going to happen far more slowly than most people are arguing. He likes the idea of one degree per century. And so since we're already at one degree, the blue line there goes from one degree to two degrees by 2100. In terms of decarbonization, there is no decarbonization. He actually suggests that we ought to be consuming more fossil fuels, as you can see in the green line there. And not surprisingly, I would suggest that the science here would suggest that the temperature scenario associated with Epstein scenario is not two degrees C. It could very well be five degrees C or more because he's basically suggesting a substantial increase in fossil fuel use, partially because his argument is that fossil fuels let us dominate the impacts of climate change. And so by using fossil fuels, we can counter the impacts of climate change. I think that's a grossly simplistic and somewhat dangerous perspective, but that is the perspective that Alex Epstein is, is now delivering in apparently lots of talks around the country and interviews and YouTube videos. It's, it's certainly something to be aware of. Now, I think it's useful to think about how, where these things fall on a risk continuum, because that's a key issue. I come at this from a risk perspective and to summarize the Epstein stuff, basically almost no sensitivity to risk of getting it wrong, of having the science wrong, of what could go wrong with his assumptions. And given the fact that we're talking about a one-way irreversible experiment, approaching this with no sensitivity to risk, his only sensitivity to risk is that of decarbonization. His view is, is that decarbonizing poses an enormous risk and that climate change doesn't pose a risk. And uh, so he's at one end of this spectrum and Bacchus coming at this very much from a risk perspective is very risk sensitive. It's not a great idea to be rolling the dice on all sorts of uncertainties and variables that are key to thinking about what happens with climate change. So what are some of the takeaways that I would suggest? I would suggest that in looking at, at these, and there are many others, but in looking at these kinds of analyses, it's not so much a matter of, is somebody in denial about climate change, not denial about climate change. I think getting into the details of how fast will things happen, and that's a trap that you really do need to understand though, what people are saying their underlying global energy and development goals are, what's technically possible ray decarbonization, what the economic, political uncertainties and risks are that could slow decarbonization, what is the established climate science? What are the climate uncertainties and risks? And these are the things that you really have to look at and balance and come to conclusions about in deciding which of these storylines you think are a good idea. And an awful lot of this doesn't come back down to the science per se. It comes down to how we assess and perceive climate risk. And I think that's something that generally speaking, we're not doing a very good job of exploring. So I've delivered this talk from inside the climate web, massive knowledge management system for all things climate change. You can actually go in and, and dig into all of these books in the climate web in considerably more depth. Hope this has been interesting and useful. Thanks.